Sometimes she likes to, to wrap around me like this, and it's a little... Extracting. <laughs> yeah, getting her out again. That's the problem. <laughs> so my area is bio-inspired robotics and how to learn from living animals to make robots that function as well as the living animals. Because anyone can string a bunch of servo motors together to make a snake robot, for instance, but what makes snakes so special is how they actually control their locomotion. It's those control algorithms that we're trying to figure out that gives them the versatility they need to move through their habitat. We start by analyzing how they move. So we use motion capture cameras and study their motion. We use instruments to study the forces. We're currently embarking on a project to understand their muscles. Um, but also a key aspect is going to be understanding what happens when they encounter a disturbance. If they're moving through a series of, of objects and one of them yields and breaks, how does the snake respond to that disturbance? That gives us insight into what they're controlling. Are they controlling force, velocity, position? How are they handling this? We have a robot that's capable of three of the four modes of snake locomotion. We're very limited. Motors are nowhere near as good as muscle yet in a variety of ways. Uh, we can't. Our snake robot, for instance, has uh, 24 servo motors, whereas a real snake, she has over 200 vertebrae in her body and several dozen more in her tail, each of which has 40 different muscles crossing every single joint. Yeah, we're <laughs> still a ways away from replicating the true elegance of snake locomotion. <laughs> So yeah, you're obviously well known for the uh, having the snake. Yeah, <laughs> the snake is arguably the most famous part of the lab, <laughs> and I'm finally I'm I'm working on a grant for him. But oh, she's poking through the sideburns. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, let's move this. And this. I really need to pay them to put more power outlets in this place. So what's your lab then? Is it, you say it's um, biology-inspired robotics? Yeah, bi biology, comparative biomechanics, biorobotics, because it goes both ways. We can use the animals to help us understand how to build better robots, but the great thing about robots is Unlike animals, robots will do what you tell them to do every single time, and they'll do the same thing every single time. So it makes it easy to test hypotheses, including sort of what if hypotheses. What if the animal didn't do the thing that it does to adjust to a particular environmental change or what happens? Would it fail? We don't know because the animal won't do it, but the robot will. So, because we tell it to. <laughs> the robot is actually quite simple. It's just a series of Dynamixel servo motors, Dynamixel XL320s. So these are commercially available servos. And uh, Dynamixels, they have their own controller, but it's basically a modified Arduino, Arduino-based code, so on and so forth. So bring this around and it doesn't even, it's not even that good of an Arduino. It's not like a mega or anything. There we go. Oh, I need to fiddle with those parameters. So yeah, so this one, the snake robot is performing uh, sidewinding. Let's give it a little boost for speed. Sidewinding is this strange mode of locomotion used by a variety of desert snakes. And it can use sidewinding to move on shifting desert sands. Desert sand is very hard to move on for a variety of reasons, but the short version is if you press it one way, it solidifies like a solid. If you press it another way, it yields and flows like a fluid. And predicting which is going to happen is very difficult. And so snakes have evolved this method that allows them to move across a huge range of sand substrates very easily. and. Uh, it's robust to the different types of sand. They don't have to test for exactly what the sand is doing. So I did some previous work at Georgia Tech with the actual Sidewinder rattlesnakes, and that's how we came up with the algorithm for this, which is really just two sine waves. They have a, a horizontal wave right to left along the body and a vertical wave. You can see how it's lifted its body clear of the substrate here. So it's got this lifting and lowering sort of system going on. As a result, it can transition to lateral undulation, 
and then back to side winding. Um, but basically we have a sine wave for left to right, a sine wave for up and down, and they're slightly offset, and that's it. The actual code to produce this is maybe 15 lines. And so uh, similarly for lateral undulation, let me fiddle with the parameters for that one before it swaps over. So snakes can move through this typical slithering gait. And uh, this is still a pale imitation of the grace and beauty of real snakes. But uh, this is just a single wave. Uh, we're working on more complex implementations. And finally, it can even perform something called concertina locomotion. And so once it gets to that point, it'll finish a cycle. So this is what they do inside of a tunnel. If it hit the tunnel wall, it would be detecting that. Unfortunately, I don't have the tunnel set up at the moment. But basically, it stretches its body forwards, like you see here. And then it feels for the wall of the tunnel. And if there was a real tunnel, it would detect that and automatically adjust itself and then inchworm its way forward. Just like the real snake, it's actually not a terribly efficient form of locomotion. And that's true for these guys as well. Their endurance drops dramatically when you do this. It's sort of a last resort mode of locomotion. So the only one it's missing so far is actually a form called um, uh, rectilinear. And that's actually where they can ripple their belly scales alone. It's a form of locomotion powered entirely by the skin. And unfortunately, we don't have skin actuators that are good enough for that yet, but we're working on it, so. <laughs> Can you say, right, go over there and that sort of thing? This is a purely feed forward mechanism, so it does not yet have external sensors. That's another area that we're working on, uh, how to control this thing. So right now, the biggest issue is they're still tethered because they wind up drawing a tremendous amount of energy um, when they, I mean, this thing is pulling over an amp at any given time. So it, it sucks down the energy pretty fast. It's yeah, we're a ways away from fully autonomous snake bots, but we're getting there bit by bit. I like to say that snake robots are sort of where humanoid robots were 20 years ago and now look at Boston Dynamics. And in fact, Boston Dynamics is an excellent example of this. All of those magnificent robots, they're based on the, uh, the control mechanisms observed for human locomotion. So when we walk, we use an inverted pendulum. We sort of vault over a stiff limb, and when we run, our limb becomes springy. And by uh, controlling those dynamics, that's how Boston Dynamics is able to make their robots do amazing things, is because they're trying to control just the center of mass trajectory and the springiness of the effective limb, which can be multiple limbs if it's one of their quadrupeds. And then they have sort of secondary processes, I imagine, that they handle all the little sort of details of what joint gets how many volts and things like that. Just like with us, it's all handled in our spinal cord. There's a lot of that stuff where if we're walking, our brain is just sending a few signals saying, go roughly this fast in this direction. And the spinal cord takes care of all of that stuff of which muscle turns on when and how and responses to a perturbation like missing a step or something like that. So there's a lot of decentralization even in humans. So Is this something anyone could do? Absolutely. This is just off-the-shelf servo motors, XL320s with 3D printed brackets connecting them, but I've built tons of others with regular high-tech servos. And then you just uh, impose a sine wave. What I basically do is I, I say, here's a sign, I compute a sine wave and I say, every motor has a certain phase offset and then I impose a global phase offset on the sine wave at successive time intervals. And the trick is I sort of tweak the time interval so that the motors have enough time to get where they're going. Um, the other thing is dynamixels are great because you can daisy chain them. So if I pop this out so it's not long, no longer doing anything. So I can string one input along for six motors. So this is the, the vertical lead, the horizontal lead for these six. You can technically go more than six, but I wind up having problems with the voltage uh, drops at the end and the motors aren't quite doing what they need to. You could see that a little bit at the tail. Sometimes the voltage drops a little bit at the tail. Um, normal servo motors, it's just a simple one, one thing. You can hook them up in parallel with a lot of soldering if you want. But uh, my personal favorite for snake robots that aren't Dynamixels is actually the Lynx motion controller, Lynx like the animal, and it has 32 servo channels. I use Python because 
A, it's a snake name, and I like snakes, <laughs> but also <laughs> it's what I, my predecessor used. And so you just send a serial command that says channel number 13, go to position seven, uh, 750, and take 700 milliseconds to do it. And then you just repeat that, send all the commands in a chain, and the robot will go to that position, and then you wait for a little bit, go to the next time step, move it to the next position, so on and so forth. These are more sophisticated than regular servos for all sorts of reasons, but yeah. The ultimate end game for this is snakes, the whole reason snakes evolved, the whole reason they lost their limbs and got this elongate body form is to move through cluttered, complex, and confined environments. So they're really good at dealing with those sort of things like, say, exploring Mars, or a building has collapsed and you want to find out if there's people under there, or you want to go sneak into a bad guy's house and see what they're talking about through the walls and the cabling and things like that. That's what snakes are excellent at, and that's why this elongate, limbless form of uh, body has actually evolved over 24 independent times just in lizards. Snakes are merely the most successful of those. There's actually 23 other groups of limbless lizards, um, plus a bunch of other times. So it's a very, very common strategy, and it's always associated with these cluttered, confined environments, which is where limbed robots and things with more sort of chunky, boxy bodies don't do as well. In fact, if you or a dog or an insect runs across a cluttered field of rocks and logs and debris, in order to not fall down, we get slower. We have to slow ourselves down to accommodate this complexity. Snakes actually get faster because when they're doing that undulating form of locomotion, what they're doing, their body is hitting those obstacles and using them as push points. So they get faster the more cluttered their environment is. And so that's a real advantage and something that people are keen on capitalizing on. So. We've got this motion capture system and uh, we're going to be looking at the arboreal locomotion of snakes. And so the idea is that we'll take a snake and we'll put little reflective markers. Text message, maybe you're sending a video, suddenly the bandwidth becomes actually a bit of a problem. This may not be an issue depending on the application.